Greetings folks, I'm Anto and today we're going to be continuing our making a homebrew campaign series by making our main villain, our primary antagonist, our big bad evil guy. If you're new to the series I've spent the last few months building a homebrew campaign setting for Dungeons and Dragons and I've recorded every step of the process. I'll leave a link in the description below to a playlist with all the previous videos and there'll be one up in the card as well. So today we're going to be talking about the first big bad that our players are going to encounter in the starting city of Azim. But before we do that I want to talk about some of the types of villains that you might want to include in your games. I'll leave timestamps to all the different sections in the description down below so that you can jump to whichever you want. A campaign doesn't have to start with a world ending threat. You don't need a huge maniacal evil overlord right at the start of your campaign for your players to feel happy and content. They're going to be happy enough to play through some minor quests before they even touch a big bad. When you do introduce your first villain though, that villain doesn't need to be the villain of the entire campaign. They don't need to be the one that your players are going to be working towards defeating for 15 to 20 levels. It works really well to have smaller scale villains that are more appropriate for your party's level. These sort of villains should definitely be a threat, but they should be defeatable within a level or two for your players so that they can work towards defeating them, but not feel like there's no chance they could ever win. That being said, your main villain can be a monster, however. In my current campaign, the first major villain that my players went against was a vampire that didn't have any grand schemes, they didn't want to take over the world. They were just a vampire trying to stay alive, trying to turn people and drain people, and that provided plenty of conflict for my players at that early level. In fact, that vampire served as the overarching villain for about the first 15 sessions before they were discovered and defeated, and then the first scheming villain really came out. But instead of having two distinct villains, I introduced the NPC that would go on to be my party's first major scheming villain, long before they actually became a villain. This particular NPC was the deputy justice in the city that the players were in and in killing the vampire that they'd been tracking for about 15 weeks that kicked off a chain of events that led to that particular politician seizing power and creating a whole mess of problems for the party. Because the party already knew this character before he became the outright villain, it was much more personal when he started to perform actions that impacted the party or the NPCs that they'd gotten to know. It was so personal in fact that the party barbarian snuck out in the middle of the night away from the rest of the party and attempted to assassinate this NPC on his own. Needless to say, it did not go well, the NPC was a much higher level than I think the Barbarian had assumed, and he barely escaped with his life. But that tipped off this NPC to the party's plans, and then everything they did from that point was much more difficult because the NPC knew that the party wanted him dead. Having main villains that evolve and change over the course of a campaign is a great way to give your players a sense of direction, because it always gives them a goal and something to centre themselves on if they get a little bit lost in all the plot and story. So what types of big bad are there? Well there are probably as many villain types as there are villains out there, but I want to focus on four of the what I consider to be key villain types today, and we're going to start with the everyday antagonist. These aren't villains who are bent on world domination, they don't have any exceptional powers, rather they bother our heroes on a much more small and personal scale. A couple of great examples of the everyday antagonist are Draco Malfoy from the Harry Potter series or the Hound from the Song of Ice and Fire books or the Game of Thrones show. Both of these characters are at points of vile characters who you root against and who cause problems for our heroes, but neither of them possess otherworldly powers or anything that would make them a contender for the principal villain in a story. They aren't godlike beings or scheming overlords and they're best used as short-term villains for your campaign. On the other end of the spectrum to the everyday antagonist is the evil overlord. These are the classic pure evil villains, the 
scheming bad guys that want nothing more than world domination or to destroy the world or have some other large grand plan. These tend to be exceptionally powerful villains who aren't as easy to overcome. Great examples of this type of villain are Sauron from the Lord of the Rings series or the Night King from A Song of Ice and Fire or someone like Voldemort in the Harry Potter series. There might be reasons that these villains end up how they are but our story isn't so much concerned with making us sympathize with these characters as it is with making it clear that these are the embodiment of pure evil. There's never any question or moral ambiguity as to whether the heroes are doing the right thing when you're going against the evil overlord because they are so outlandishly evil that you couldn't question that they have to be stopped. The Evil Overlord is a classic endgame villain for D&D, and with good reason. Once you reach the higher levels, your characters become so powerful that ordinary mortal villains don't really pose a threat, and it doesn't really make sense for your characters, your party, to be going and dealing with those kinds of things. So you need to seek out bigger and badder foes, and the Evil Overlord is the perfect villain for that. Next up we have my personal favourite kind of villain, the Immoral Entity. This villain represents some kind of broken system, and our heroes aren't as much fighting against the individual villain as they are fighting against the system itself. Probably the very best example of this is Dolores Umbridge in The Order of the Phoenix book from the Harry Potter series. She is a perfectly ordinary person, but she represents such a vile corruption that you can't help but hate her and some people hate her more than they hate Voldemort. The Immoral Entity is a great villain to throw in front of your players a little bit into a campaign. By that point your players will usually be used to solving things with violence but violence doesn't really solve the Immoral Entity at least not in the short term because the big bad in this case isn't so much that one person it's the system as a whole or what it represents. It's much much harder for your players to see simply end things with violence. Because of this, it forces your players to think in new ways to try and tackle the problem, which is never a bad thing. As a larger system, the Immoral Entity can make life really difficult for your players. They can change laws, they can impact your players outside of combat in a way that they might not be used to. The chances are that your players will eventually come to some kind of blows with an individual as part of the resolution to the Immoral Entity, but in the interim between starting that section of your campaign and ending it, you'll have plenty of scope for non-combat resolutions. And finally, we come to one of the most iconic and most powerful types of villain, the tragic villain. These are the villains whose motivations, no matter how flawed, are relatable enough that people tend to agree with them at least on some kind of level. Some great examples of tragic villains in fiction are Darth Vader who fell to the dark side for the love of his wife, Loki from the Marvel Cinematic Universe who only ever wanted his parents acceptance, or Thanos also from the MCU who watched his entire race die due to overpopulation and poor resource management and in his own flawed way is trying to prevent that from happening again. However twisted these characters motivations become or however heinous their actions along the way are, they almost always start from a place that is very human and very relatable and that's what makes them such great villains. You obviously want your heroes to succeed but with a good tragic villain there's always a part of you that will be rooting for them even just a little bit because their motivations come from such a relatable place. Tragic villains also make an excellent lieutenant for an evil overlord. Because the tragic villain starts from a relatable place there's a chance that the players are going to be able to bring them back over to the good side during the course of the campaign and use them as a powerful ally against the evil overlord. I find it's best to use a combination of all of these different tropes as well as using multiple tiers of villains along the course of a campaign to give your players a really satisfying experience. Start out really small with a villain that would have no real consequence on the wider world and slowly build the tension until the players are 
are facing villains who are appropriate for their power level. Now that we've spent some time talking about the different kinds of villains that there are, I want to talk about our first major villain in our new homebrew campaign. Last week I spent some time coming up with over a hundred NPCs for the city of Azim and one really stood out to me as having the potential to be a great first big bad guy. With that, I think the first major villain of our campaign is going to be Palav Ghani, the ambitious son of one of the Merchant Guild leaders. He's a member of the Dinamal, the investigators and detectives of the city of Azim, so he has a level of power and influence and he also has a very clear motivation. He wants to be in control of his family. He resents his father for making his twin sister Sophia his heir and he will do anything to gain power. This makes Palav a great villain under the immoral entity mold. As part of the law enforcement for Azim, he's going to be able to use his power and influence to make life for our players particularly difficult. But he isn't a super powered magical villain, he's not a monster, he's just a human man with human ambition and he's in a position of power to make life threatening for our players. We don't need to decide the intricate details of Palav's plan right away because I'm a big believer that your villains, their plans should change based on what the party does but we can get some motivations and some baseline details figured out for him so his primary goal is that he wants to be the leader of his family he wants to be one of the leaders of the merchant guild he wants a seat at that table a second goal for palav is going to be to kill his father that resentment has turned to hatred and if he can eliminate his father on his path to power all the better for it. And thirdly, he wants to remove his sister. He doesn't hate her in the same way that he hates her father, and he won't start out by necessarily wanting her dead, but he will be open to that, and if the players manage to coordinate with Sophia and make Palav's life difficult, then that will turn to a rage, and he will want her out of the way no matter what the cost. But he'll begin from a place of just wanting to see her removed from a position of power and ideally imprisoned. So we know some of Palav's motivations. We know he wants to imprison his sister, ideally kill his father and above all else become the head of his family and get a seat at the table among the merchant guild. We know that he is a member of the city's law enforcement, a reasonably high ranking member, so he has a level of power and influence and he can use that power and influence against our party. How Palav goes about achieving his goals is really going to depend on how the sessions progress but we don't need to know that we know his motivations we know the type of person that he is and using that information we can respond and react to the events that unfold in game so there you have it that is how i build major villains i really hope you found this video useful if you liked it give it a thumbs up if you hated it give it a thumbs down and i'd love to hear about your villains down in the comments below tell me about your minor villains tell me about your major villains tell me about your big bad evil guy down in the comments below if you're new here and like what you see don't forget to hit that subscribe button because i release new rpg content every single week and if you like what i do here consider supporting me on on patreon you get early access to each week's videos you get additional behind the scenes content and you get some extra rpg related content too but until next time happy gaming thanks for watching if you're new here don't forget to hit that subscribe button down below for new content every single friday and if you want to keep watching well there's another couple videos for you to watch just over there happy gaming